This is the lecture for ancient and medieval history for Friday, the 18th of March, 2022, and we are working through the uh, latter phases of the great crisis of the third century. We talked about how with the increased threats on Rome's borders, the problem of imperial succession the refusal of Augustus to come to grips with the question who becomes emperor when the old emperor dies comes back to haunt Rome with a vengeance. In the aftermath of Commodus's assassination and later Alexander Severus's assassination, civil war becomes the preferred method. Uh, you probably won't. Uh, civil war becomes the preferred method of choosing the next emperor. This is disastrous because the Roman army ends up destroying itself during the 50-year civil war as a recognizable entity. It's no longer, it no longer exists. Meanwhile, the Goths and Germans double the threat in the north. The Persians quintuple the threat in the east. The empire splits, then comes together, then it's going to split again. How to solve this problem? By the end of the crisis, the only force for law and order is the emperor's personal field army. And he's moving right back and forth from the Rhine to the Persian border. And there's a lesser degree of trouble in Britain and along the North African border with the desert. How to deal with this is the big question. So keep that in mind as we look at the crisis, because something else has happened. As these armies have fought one another, hammering tongs, each general has had to agree to pay donatives to his troops. A donative is a bribe. But they don't have money. So they dilute the coinage, causing money to come into question. If you have coins that could be 20% silver, 80%, 50%, 5% silver, how do you judge? Since it's not the symbols on the coin that give it value, but the content of the precious metals. If, in fact, a supposedly silver coin is not silver anymore, this is a serious problem. And we end up with a hyperinflation because more and more and more and more silver coins are needed to take the place that a single silver piece used to be able to fill. Hyperinflation. So we have a massive decline in peace. We have a large destruction of the civilian lifestyle. I've tried explaining how important the civilian lifestyle is. The ability of everyday people to go about their lives working and producing without worrying about being attacked, well, that's gone. If you, if you aren't safe in Spain from Gothic raids, and they weren't, I told you about the Goths and Germans who came across the Rhine, used the road, and raided Spain. If you're not safe in Egypt from attacks from the northern frontier, you're not safe anywhere. Aurelian built walls around Rome because he knew Rome would need them, and he was right. Eventually, Rome did. <clears throat> Simultaneously, desperate emperors boosted tax rates, in expecting people to pay a larger proportion of whatever little they were able to produce under these hellish circumstances to taxes to pay for, the, for his army. So the government becomes a predator upon its own civilian population, that which is left, because the government is now rapaciously going after whatever they can find. They'll raid farms for hidden food. People can't be trusted to pay their taxes anymore. Rich people. 
I'll talk about this next year, find some pretty unusual ways of dealing with their taxes. And in some places, the empire is returning to barter. People are withdrawing behind improvised walls. People are taking what used to be decorative features and ripping them apart and making them into ad hoc fortifications. Let's look at the religious and social implications of all of this. This is true. It's true enough to be basically one of the ongoing themes of the Old Testament. But it's also true in any civilization you want to look at. The austere values of religion that are usually present at the phase of a civilization when it's rising and gaining power are often abandoned once that civilization has had a sufficient period of peace and prosperity. It's like valuing, valuing masculinity. Any society with wisdom values masculine and feminine traits. Why? Because without tough guys, you're all victims. No. Strong, empowered women cannot stand up against rapacious groups of uncivilized, barbaric men. Whether you're talking about street crime or invasion or everything in between, a society needs its sheepdogs to survive. But Rome had been at peace for so long that the sheepdogs were considered an anachronism. The same thing has happened to us. You have companies trying to prove their woke credentials by talking about toxic masculinity. I believe it was the Remington Razor Company that ran ads a couple of years ago. This is a company that makes men's razors, talking about to toxic masculinity, and we've got to evolve past that. No. You evolve past that, and you are going to be conquered. The Roman world is now thrown back on its local resources. The only imperial help is occasional visits by the emperor's army if, if you're in a danger zone. And the emperor's army is going to come for your stuff just as aggressively as the barbarians will. You need the local men to be willing to risk their lives for women and children. And that doesn't happen if women and children don't give the men the respect they feel they deserve. You may not like it because it's not politically correct, but traditional society exists everywhere. Europe, Asia, Africa, Paleolithic, Neolithic, Metal Ages, ancient, medieval, modern, up to the present postmodern era. There is a reason why the one thing that's in common between all human civilizations is gender roles. This is not to say that we can't have a society that opens up opportunities for women, but when you destroy or attempt to destroy the very concept of traditional gender roles, males stop being men and females stop being women. People stop having children. They stop making families and they stop being able to protect themselves the way they need to in an increasingly risky world. What I have just said is against everything pop culture has tried to teach you over the last 16 years or however long you've been alive. This is a voice from the past. There is a reason why male and female exist in any society from the Siriono tribes of the Amazon rainforest to the Chinese Empire because it's a reality of our existence. Without feminine women to be wives and mothers, children are not raised right. Without masculine men who are willing to spend their lives in labor for their families and risk their lives in battle to protect their families, it falls apart. Now, when things are good, peaceful and prosperous, you may think we've evolved past that. Then things get rough again. 
and we're back to it. And this is what happened with Rome in the third century. The problem was the Romans had been peaceful for so long that even in extremists, there weren't enough Roman men willing or able to step up and take up arms in protection of their own homes. And so the barbarians, even though they were way outnumbered by the Romans, are going to end up having their way with the Romans. You may have 55 sheep in a fold, but a single dog or a single wolf will kill as many sheep as he wants. And the other sheep may try to drive it away, but it's not an ideal situation if you go ba rather than wolf. Increased misery brings increased religious interest. This is another thing. Increased misery. There's another way of saying it, a more modern way. There are no atheists in foxholes. When you are comfortable, you can experiment with questions of whether or not there is a God, whether or not there is a universal order, whether or not there is somebody up there looking out for you. But when you work in dangerous situations, when the bullets are flying or the axes are being thrown at you, most people find religion. Why? One of the illusions of civilization is that we're in control. We create this artificial world of culture that makes us seem like we're in control. If we can talk about something, we can explain it away with science or statistics or economics. We can bip, 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 and suddenly a chaotic world seems like it's under human control. There's a secret. It's not. We don't fully understand in an intellectually rational or logical way the stock market, nor do we fully understand the power grid on a theoretical level. We use it, on, we use both on the practical level. But there's a reason why people are paid ridiculous amounts of money to analyze the stock market, because the stock market does not follow logical, predictable rules. You're dealing with creatures who have free will who are all going after their self-interest at the same time. This produces a very difficult to predict market. Electrical power can be stored very inefficiently in batteries. For the most part, the power grid has to generate power in real time. If we need this much power, we'd better be producing at least this much power. We can't produce much over because it wastes energy and it burns up our wires. So we've got to try to match what the power output is of all of our various power plants, coal powered, um, hydroelectric powered, nuclear powered, whatever, natural gas powered. <laughs> In some cases, they have trash energy plants. And uh, we've got to match it moment by moment to need. Now, on a hot summer afternoon, you know electrical demand is going to be through the roof because of air conditioning. There are things you can predict. But if you mess up, if you fail to predict accurately, the power grid can actually black out. We don't understand it theoretically. We understand it practically. And we depend on the stock markets of the world to regulate global economics, and we depend on the power grid to give us the electricity, I don't know, that does almost everything for us. We have replaced slave labor with bzzz, with electrical devices. And without the electricity, nothing works. So why do people turn to religion when life gets scary? Because the reality that we're not in control has been made clear. We are back in the forests, in the middle of a thunderstorm. We are back on the lake in a small boat as the lightning crashes around you and the waves are a few feet high. We are riding the rapids in a rubber raft that has just punctured. We are not in control, and we know it. In a case like that, human beings tend to find religion. They tend to start praying because they're desperate for something, someone 
They help them, but they cannot help themselves. It's the same reason a tattletale tattles. Tattletale's dealing with a bully. Bully's a jerk. Bully's got to be dealt with. Tattletale doesn't feel as strong enough to handle the bully on his own. Tattletale tattles in order to get somebody stronger, perceived stronger, to deal with the situation. When times are good, seems like we don't need God. When times are bad, most people find a need for God. And finding that need, they find God in some way, shape, or form. This is true in the crisis of the third century also. So we have... Um, the Olympian gods <clears throat> really are purely patriotic at this point. They do not satisfy almost anyone. You have a great hunger. The hunger has been growing since Jesus' time, since before Jesus' time, for meaning. Why do good people die? Why do bad people prosper? Why? 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 Answering those questions is something science can't do, it's something rationalism can't do, and it's something that human action or intention cannot do. Why is an existential question. And we don't know the answer. So we make leaps of faith. Don't tell me there are people today who don't do that with science. Oh, I believe in science, really. Do you understand the experimental uh, data that goes into the scientific theories that you're spouting? Do you understand the exceptions that scientists have? Do you understand the data that's been excluded because it's considered to be an outlier? Do you understand the theoretical bases of the experiments, which are also themselves leaps of faith, that lead scientists to these conclusions? Science is not truth. Science is a set of theories that explain the world as theoretical ideas. This is a theory. It's based on this data. This data indicates this theory is probably right. We can use it theoretically. But you and I have seen over the last few years people use science as a religion. Oh, I believe in science, therefore I'll do this. I believe in science, therefore I'll do that. Why? Because some guy in a lab coat tells you so, who has a PhD or a doctor's after their name or a doctor title. People who don't understand the science slavishly follow the recommendation of certain scientists. That's not science. That's superstition. That is as religious as religion can be. I have chicken bones. I'm going to cast them, and I will tell you the future with those chicken bones. I know the stars. I can do a star chart of when you were born and where you were born and tell you not only what kind of person you're going to be, but what kind of fate you're going to be, you're going to have. Ultimately, each of us figures out what we believe. Not by having it proven to us. Those are just facts. What we believe, whether we believe in science, whatever that means, whether we believe in Christ, whatever that means, whether we believe in Yahweh or Allah or the ever-changing uh, chain of reincarnation or the Buddha or Brahma or Amaterasu Omikami or the Ant, the Enti or the Inca or any of this, it's a question that cannot be answered through logic, reason, so we make a leap of faith. We decide, I trust this. Why? Because I do. Because it makes sense to me. It's not an intellectual thing, it's an emotional thing, and it's very powerful. And I'm not trying to degrade it at all. I'm not trying to say it's less valuable because it's a leap of faith. Quite the contrary. People don't kill each other usually over facts. They kill each other over faith. They also become noble, noble creatures because of things they believe. Because we can't prove it. We can't prove our beliefs. We have to take them on faith. So, let me see if I included this in your notes. There's a picture of a dreamy-eyed guy in the third century that maybe, I hope, I included in your notepad. Yep. Lower right, right under Maximinus Thraxus, and down into the right from Catacalla. It's not the best photocopy. But this guy is in the midst of the crisis. 
And if you can look at it and try to get an impression from this little guy on the lower right here, he's not looking at the person doing the sculpture. He's looking off into the middle distance. He has what's called in the military the thousand-yard stare. He is looking beyond the physical world into the world of the gods. Why? If this life stinks, I'm hoping for the next one. If this life has no control, I will put myself in the hands of whatever gods I believe in. I will trust in them, because I can't handle this anymore. It's not weakness. It's human nature. We can imagine things that never were. And because of the way we're built, we can make those things as real to us as the most tangible thing. That, that means thing that we can touch. So when the world is falling apart, you end up with dreamy-eyed man. Because in dreams, things make sense. In reality, it's a roll of the dice. And people can't live with that. So, the cults of soul, we do it in weakness, the soul of the cult of Isis, the, whole, the, cult, the cult of Hercules comes back, but with an Asian twist. Is Hercules strong? Strong, god-like man, able to handle life. Mithra, we talked about the great rise of Christianity. What does Christianity offer people that they hadn't been getting before? Well, first of all, Christianity is not for heroes. Christianity is for everyone who wants to believe. Women, children, slaves, men, lower class, upper class, doesn't matter. And Christ doesn't demand that we fight like Achilles or like Hector. What he demands is that we be decent to one another, that we forgive, that we act not from a basis of revenge, but from a basis of love. And any person, whether they're smart or stupid, whether they're educated or uneducated, whether they're rich or poor, anyone can be decent. Miss Solzvik and I don't see the eye to eye on many things. I admire the heck out of her. She's a wonderful person. She's a great teacher. And one of the best quotes I've ever seen is not on my wall, it's on her door. In a world where you can be anything, I think it's be kind or be nice or something like that. That's a great quote. And it's absolutely true. And that's what Christianity does. It turned, as you'll see in the Middle Ages, it turns Vikings into modern Scandinavians who are very peaceful people. So if the world is falling apart around you, and God doesn't expect you to personally fix it all, God just expects you within your own little circle not to be a jerk to people, not to betray them, not to use or manipulate them, to be honest, to be, to be kind. Anyone can do that. And what do you get? Eternal life in a blissful state in the presence of God. So the reward is heaven. After 9-11, there was a great country song. I'm not usually a country fan, and I don't remember much about it, but I remember the refrain. What are you going to do, threaten me with heaven? You're going to threaten to kill me? I try to live righteously. If I die righteously, fine. I go to heaven. You're going to threaten me with that? And that was a Christian version of the Islamic belief that if you die for the faith, you're going straight to heaven. Well, Christians believe this too, just not so militantly in the sense of wartime. So do Jews. But Jews, Judaism is not an evangelical religion. Christianity is. So in a world where less and less and less makes sense, Christianity grows. But the empire doesn't control it. The imperial government is suspicious of anything that has that much power. The Chinese Communist Party today is the same way. In the 90s, there was a meditation movement that was about eating right and exercising calling Falun Gong, called Falun Gong. Falun Gong wasn't political. It was getting up every day, doing a variant of Tai Chi together, uh, trying to balance your spirit. It was sort of based in old... Uh, Chinese geomancy, uh, feng shui ideas, and uh, Chinese Taoism. But it wasn't political. It wasn't anti-communist. But the Communist Party came in and crushed it. 
And the primary people whose organs have been harvested over the last 30 years have been Falun Gong practitioners because they're so healthy. Why? How does meditating and eating right and exercising, how does that threaten the Communist Party? Well, the Communist Party of China wasn't in control of it. It was something outside of their control, so they crushed it reflexively because it could have been used against them at some point. To its everlasting shame, Pope Francis and the Roman Catholic Church agreed that the Chinese Communist Party could name Catholic leaders within China. Now, the Chinese Communist Party already has a Christian church that it runs. Yes, you have a Christian denomination run by atheists because the Communist Party of China, like all Communist parties, is officially atheistic. They don't acknowledge the existence of any god other than themselves. So why would the Communist Party want to run Christian churches, Protestant and Catholic? Because if they run the churches, they can talk all the God nonsense they want in a way that won't threaten their power. In a way that won't cause them to have to abide another independent group. Nothing is allowed to exist in the People's Republic of China that is independent of communism. You can get rich if you have communists help run your company. You can become famous if you have communists helping to guide your career and make sure that all of your um, acting and all of your movies and all of your projects and songs uh, are, are in conformity with Communist Party beliefs. But anything independent, people who are paranoid and power hungry, is a threat. So the Christian faith, as it explodes, is increasingly under persecution. The Roman government cannot solve the problem of the Goths or the Germans long term because they're outside the empire. They can't solve the problem of Persia because it's outside the empire. Christians are within the empire. It's like, look, this can be unhealthy, but there is something mentally healthy I feel miserable and depressed. My life is falling apart. I'm going to do the dishes. Oddly enough, try it sometimes. Or do some other chore that's physically involved. Oddly enough, it can help. Does it solve all the big... No. But you've done something to make your life better. You've gotten the dishes cleaned, dried, put away. You've done something. You've mowed the lawn. You've done something. You've cut and stacked firewood. You've done something. You've dusted and vacuumed. Do something. Cleaning up your room is actually very good for mental health in two ways. Number one, nobody likes to live in a mess. Really, even Oscar Madison, it was a sign of, well, that's an old reference from another show. The Odd Couple. Well, actually, we've seen The Odd Couple recently. Oscar Madison is, 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 is proverbially messy because his life is, gee, and he, it's an expression of his troubles. It's not because he's happy. So you clean up your room. Why? Because it's better to live in a clean environment. Your, your subconscious knows this. And two, um, while you're cleaning, you're working off stress, you're exercising, and you're doing something that you can look at an hour later and say, yeah, my life may be in the, in, 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 in the toilet, but... Darn, I've got a clean room. It's, something. it's a little thing. But when you're in a mood like that, every little thing that helps you get out of the depressed state of mind is a good thing. So the imperial government of Rome says, we can't beat the Goths or the Germans or the Persians. We can't solve the problem of not having enough money for our troops. But damn it, we can clean up the Christians. So let's persecute them, persecute them, per and that's what they do. Uh, and it's not fun to be a Christian under this, under this regime. And of course, as I've told you, yeah, everyone's a citizen, but not everyone has the old citizenship rights. The honestiores, the honorable citizens, they have citizenship rights just like in the olden days. But the humiliores, the humble citizens, they're citizens in name only. Yeah, I'm a citizen. I'm still going to torture you. I know. I'm a humble citizen. I'm a citizen. Yeah, but you're still going to build roads during your off time without pay. 
as a part of your taxes. Okay, I'm a humble citizen. And so on and so forth, and up to crucifixion. So, society is on the edge. Now, why does this matter? And before we go into the dominate, there are two reasons why it matters. Two reasons why it is good that Rome doesn't fall in the 3rd century. Had Rome fallen in the 3rd century, the Christian faith is still weak and divided inside the empire and has only just begun to convert the Germans and Goths. Most of the Germans and Goths are still pagans. This matters. Because 200 years later, when the Roman Empire finally does fall, the strongest institution that helps alleviate some suffering is the Christian Church, which is the official religion of Rome by that point. And by the time the Germans and Goths conquer the Western Roman Empire, they're Christians. They're not the same kind of Christians, but they're all Christians. Now, are these Germans and Goths violent Christians? Yes. But they still have the Christian idea which holds them back and which makes them sometimes respect churches and churchmen and it makes possible civilization to hang on within the walls of churches and monasteries. That would not have happened. And it did not happen when you were dealing with pagan barbarians. It did happen when you were dealing with Christian barbarians. So one really good reason why the empire surviving the third century was worth it to us is that the civilization of Rome was preserved by the church because the barbarians, Christians, and the church had become very strong. Neither of which was case in the third century. It was in the fifth. Second reason. In the third century, <clears throat> the emperors are itineraries. They're hobos. They wander. Constantly fighting, constantly fighting, constantly fighting. The same man who sets the stage for making Christianity the official religion of Rome, the third most important emperor in Roman imperial history, Constantine the Great, um, hasn't yet been born. And so there's no Constantinople. Constantinople is built where it is because it's incredibly defensible and because it's partway between the Danube and the Persian frontier. If the emperor is in Constantinople, he can easily defend his northern front and his eastern front. Constantinople's existence is going to make the Byzantine Empire possible for the next thousand years after the fall of Rome. Without Constantinople, you don't have a heart of the Eastern Roman Empire, and it probably is going to fall. Without a Byzantine Empire, Europe goes Muslim in the six or seven hundreds. So it's really, really, really good for us and our Western civilization that the Roman Empire survives. And the reason it survives is because of Diocletian. Diocletian is not the second most important Roman emperor for nothing. Diocletian ushers in the last phase of imperial Roman history called the Dominate. Its rough dates are 285 when Diocletian becomes emperor to 476 when Romulus Augustulus, last teenage emperor of Rome, gets knifed by his own bodyguard, a German king. He doesn't become emperor, he just becomes king. The end of the Roman Empire in the West, 476. And yes, I do think it's kind of interesting. 476, end of the Roman Empire, 1776, uh, the Declaration of Independence and the first stage in American independence. I don't know what it is about 76, but it caught my attention. It's excellent. So, it's in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, a little bit at the end of the 3rd. Now, it's called the Dominate. Remember how the emperor used to be Princeps, first citizen, first among equals? And then he got the military title, Imperator, he's the commands, commander. Not anymore. 
Diocletian and his successors insist on being called Dominus. Now, Dominus is what a slave calls his master. Dominus is what a worshiper calls God. Dominus is Lord. It is the opposite of the Augustan system. The Augustan system made the emperor more everyday like, I'll turn the heat up because people seem cold. So you're all healthy. You don't carry the extra warmth. Right? Warm us. If a Roman of Augustus's time would have learned that future Roman emperors would be called by the term a slave uses for their master, a worshiper for their god, they go bug nuts. Because talk about monarchy. This is more than monarchy. This is practically worshiping the emperor as a god. Dominus. And that's not all. These are the godlike emperors. For example, architects know a few tricks to trick the eye. So let's say you have a royal throne. You're looking into it like a diorama. You've got the floors and the ceilings and the walls. And you've got the throne. Big chair. Now, what you can do to make the throne seem even more impressive is you can put it on a little dais. So let's make this a dais. And we'll make this the throne. And so the king or the emperor is sitting on a pile of stones and is high above everyone else. But here's a trick. You can trick the eye by making the throne room askew, not a perfect rectangle. By making the back wall, the wall behind the throne, smaller than the wall through which you enter, you create an optical illusion. The throne is proportionally bigger relative to the back wall than the door is proportionally to the front wall. And human eyes see things in proportions. We don't have little robotic heads-up displays, do, 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 2.86 meters. No, we see things relative to one another. <laughs> There's an old joke that if you want to look thin, get fat friends. Because when you're in a group together, you're the thinnest person. That's so uncorrect. It's true, okay? It is true. It, it, I'm not saying you should do it. I'm not saying it's nice. And I'm not saying that thin people can't be friends with fat people. I am saying that if you're 20 pounds overweight and you're with a bunch of thin people, you'll be the fattest person in the group. But if you're 20 pounds overweight and you're with a bunch of people that are 60 or 70 pounds overweight, you look svelte and uh, uh, petite by comparison. So, yeah, <laughs> that's a reality. You're so horrible. So by making the room's back wall behind the throne smaller than the front wall, you create the illusion that the king is giant and that the throne is superhuman in size. And this trick of the eye is part of what is happening in Roman court life. The Romans also start taking book pages from the Persian way of treating their kings. For example, the Romans emperor in official court functions starts wearing shiny cloth of gold. And the rooms are designed to have like sun rays come through the ceiling and hit the throne from a variety of angles. And the rest of the room is kept dark on purpose, reasonably dark, relatively dark, a few candles or torches or lamps. But if you are standing there in the presence of what seems to be a larger than life emperor, and he's being hit by sunlight and he's shining 
with the cloth of gold that he's wearing. And the diadem, the gem that is uh, uh, headbanded around his forehead, is catching the light and sending colored spectral sun rays around the room. He looks almost godlike. But that's not all. If you've ever been to a Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox Mass, you know what incense smells like, and you know what bells are for. Bells indicate important events, like when the priest says, this is my body and shall be given up for you, and holds the Eucharist, the bread that is becoming the body of Christ. As an altar boy, I would go ding, 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 ding. And the same thing with the, you know, lifting up the club. Ding, 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 ding. Why? To get people's attention that this is a miracle of faith. At high masses and at funerals, I learned what adder smelled like. Because old-fashioned Catholic incense, incense, <laughs> incense, stop, incense, <laughs> doesn't smell like sandalwood. It smells like old-fashioned incense. And it has this heavy smell, this heavy, perfumey smell. But it's designed to get your attention. So these things are there to make the Mass more mystical and magical, especially at a time when most people couldn't read or write. So the Emperor starts using tricks like these. And I call them tricks. There are bells when the Emperor comes in, everyone rises. Uh, there's incense to uh, show the Emperor is there, it's being burnt. Uh, it's like the president's song hails the chief. There's a special music that's played whenever the emperor arrives, whenever the emperor leaves. And, of course, everyone who gets anywhere near the emperor is body searched. The old Romans under Augustus would never put up with this. But everyone is searched so to make sure there are no Brutuses around who have daggers. Why? Because too many emperors have been assassinated. And everyone bows. And I don't mean... From the, from the neck, I don't, I don't, or from the waist. It's, it's not a bow like this. It's not a bow like this. It is on your knees, on your face, oriental kowtow bowing. Now, a kowtow is a Chinese bow. It was used for the Chinese emperor. Sooner or later, the commies are going to do this too because they're trying to imitate the Chinese empire. It's going to be fun. Okay, so you get down on your knees, and you go like this, and then you get down, I'm not doing it, down onto your face so that your forehead touches the ground. And then you go up and you stand again. You get down on your knees and do that three times. That's the Chinese way of doing it. The Romans aren't quite so demanding. But you got to go down there at least once and put your face on the floor and bow, full body bow, to prostrate yourself and show your submission to your owner. See, this is the, dominus actually means owner. God owns you if you're a believer. You're, you're owned if you're a slave, you're property. So the emperor owns every Roman citizen. That's really what it means. That's why it's so offensive to the old idea of a, uh, an empire with republican forms. And Diocletian sets all of this up. The court ritual. Why? Because if you have Roman emperors like Carinus and Numerian who look like everyday men, why not kill him? Why not become emperor? If they're just a guy. Now, in Game of Thrones, the Lannister song, one of the royal families who were fighting for control of the throne, basically the Lannister song was, why should you be king? I'm just as strong as you are. I'm just as vicious as you are. I'm just as capable as you are. In fact, I'm probably more so. So why should you be king when I can be king? A lion still has claws. That's a, that's a pretty dangerous attitude for the emperor. So what Diocletian does by setting up all of these frou-frou, prissy court rituals is he begins to create, and it's going to take time for it to really settle in, but it does, a mystique around the emperor that says the emperor is divine. Just like the Persian emperor is divine to Zoroastrians, he's the Ahura Mazda's agent on earth, the Roman emperor is going to be the agent of the sun, or the agent of the, the Olympians, or the agent of Christ. In fact, long before the Pope, 
claimed to be God's vicar on earth. It was the Roman emperor under a Christian Roman religion. So one way you deter civil war, discourage it, is you make the emperor godlike. The second way I'm just going to allude to now, and we'll talk on Monday, you make partners. You don't stay the only emperor. You get other guys with other armies who are loyal to you, and you are loyal to them, and you'll help each other out. I guess I do have time. Let's see. Yeah, that's enough. Okay, there's a word for you. Under Diocletian, the Tetrarchy, T-E-T-R-A-R-C-H-Y, the Tetrarchy. Now, the next page at the top, what Diocletian does is he invites a fellow general who's his friend and his ally named Maximian to become co-emperor. Diocletian will rule half the empire. Maximian will rule half the empire. They're going to be partners, but they're not going to interfere with each other's rule. One of them will take the Rhine and Upper Danube. The other will take the Lower Danube and the East. Look at the statue of these two gargoyle-like men clutching each other. That's the spirit that starts the Tetrarchy. It's Diocletian and Maximian. They're no longer realistic. We're now almost into the Middle Ages in terms of aesthetics. These aren't really men. They're sort of demigods. And they're clutching each other, looking desperately into the middle distance of a dangerous and scary monster-filled world. And what do they do? They've got each other, and they've got the orb. And what does the orb represent? They've got the whole world in their hands. No joke. That's the symbolism. So these two emperors, Maximinus, I'm sorry, Maximian and Diocletian are partners who are going to together, like a dynamic duo, like a tag team in wrestling, they are going to stand against the darkness back to back. And that's going to deter civil war, assassination, and all the rest, because there's not one emperor now, there are two emperors who are partners. But wait, that's not all. If we can have two emperors, we can have four! So each of these two senior emperors, who are called Augusti, Augusti, or Augustus, takes a junior partner, who they call a Caesar. And the statue on the right, the upper right, is the whole tetrarchy. And it's the same symbolism. You've got two senior emperors, side by side, each clutching their junior empire emperor like Batman and Robin. Robin's the Caesar, the junior emperor. The junior emperor in the West is Constantine Chlorus, Constantine the Green, who rules in Britain. The junior emperor in the East is a guy named Galerius. So, Diocletian and Constantine Chlorus, Maximian and Galerius are clutching each other, but in the Tetrarchy picture, they're not holding the orb. What's their other hand on? Their swords. They are ready to fight in defense of the Roman world. Again, it's sort of an image. You're standing there in your front door, lit up, and you're looking out into the dark, and you've got a partner there, and you're going you're gonna to fight the monsters together. That's the Tetrarchy. And with the Tetrarchy, you not only have one Imperial Field Army, you now have four. But you can trust that the four armies won't betray one another. Because, like the fingers on your hand, these four armies work, and these four emperors work together. They work in concert. They're not trying to take over. They're trying to be partners. And that partnership is going to end the crisis. Diocletian, by making the emperor a godlike figure, by adopting the top title Dominus, creates a mystique about the emperor that's going to discourage assassination. 
And by taking on a partner and then three other partners, forming the Tetrarchy, the rule of four, Diocletian is going to prevent civil war because anyone who tries is going to be alone against not one emperor and one army, but against four emperors and four armies. We will continue with Diocletian's reforms on Monday. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? Okay. And I have got to say to you at home, have a good weekend.